Hey, everybody, and welcome to another Nordic APIs live cast. This is our webinar series where we feature core members from the Nordic APIs community to look into some niche topics related to API strategy. And today we're going to be discussing API monitoring and how it affects the overall API strategy. So our speakers will be describing why functional uptime surpasses performance monitoring, how to avoid bugs, as well as key metrics to monitor to help gauge the business success of a developer program. And today I am joined by, first up, Patrick Poulin. Patrick has uh, done a lot with Nordic APIs throughout the years. I think uh, this is his first live cast, but before that, uh, he spoke at the 2017 Platform Summit last year in Austin, and he's going to be speaking this year at the Austin API Summit 2020. So Patrick Poulin is the co-founder and CEO of API Fortress, an API testing automation platform that was built from the ground up for continuous API testing and unlimited functional uptime monitoring. Prior to API Fortress, Patrick worked as the API evangelist at Getty Images. Before that, he ran the retail vertical for Usable Net, where they built the first mobile websites and apps for companies including Tesco, Target, Macy's, MAC Cosmetics, and 70 other major brands. So yeah, great to have Patrick here. Um, he's a great resource on all things API monitoring and testing. So yeah, thanks for joining the webinar, Patrick. Yeah, excited to be here. And so we're gonna have him do a lightning talk, a little bit of Q&A, and then after that, we also have Derek Gilling from Mosif on the line. Hey, Derek, thanks for joining us. Um, Derek is the co-founder and CEO of Mosif, an API analytics platform based in San Francisco. Previously, he was the co-founder and CTO of Trove. After graduating from the University of Michigan, he built award-winning functional and, and formal verification software for Intel and later a computer architect on Intel's Xeon Phi, a many core CPU for HPC and ML workloads. And Derek has been working with um, Nordic APIs on the blog. He contributed some posts recently. So if you'd like to learn more after this webinar, I recommend checking out um, his articles, how to measure the success of develop developer relations. And something he wrote a couple years ago was three ways to organize your developer docs. So some, some good strategy on developer facing programs. So uh, yeah, we'll just jump right into it. Um, but first, I just have some quick updates that I would love to share with the Nordic APIs community. First up, Austin Summit is about to occur from May 4th through the 6th. We do a day of workshops on the 4th, and then the main conference is the 5th and the 6th. Um, it's a great conference. This is going to be our third year. Um, we get hundreds of attendees, uh, over 60 speakers. Registration is now open. Would love to see you there. And we also have registration open already for the Platform Summit. We'll be back to Stockholm in later in the year from October 5th to the 7th. So we're still accepting speaker submissions for that as well. On that note, we have a call for speakers that are is pretty much live throughout the year for these two events, as well as this live cast. So if you'd like to be involved in any of those, submit a talk. Our kind of idea is with uh, the Nordic APIs community, people can read and watch the content, maybe participate in the blog, write some posts, speak at the event. And then we like pulling from those people to feature keynotes at the event. So it's kind of a, a ladder to a more spotlight, if you will. If you'd like to be involved with me at all on the blog, you can just contact me there at bill at nordicapis.com. So that's my short spiel and let's get down to it. Um, let's dig into API monitoring. So first up, I will bring in Patrick. I'm gonna stop my screen share here and let him transition into what he does best. <laughs> PowerPoints. <laughs> the, it's the meanest thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> uh, all right, let me know if that works. Looks great. It's working. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. 
Perfect. So I guess uh, sort of the crux of what I want to talk about is the fundamentally how flawed what we're doing these for a lot of companies are doing for API monitoring. So more specifically, like there's a term that we use around here that people aren't using and we think it's a, it's a valuable differentiator and that's uptime versus functional uptime. So what we mean by that is with a lot of monitoring we see today and a lot of the problems we catch today and help our customers and potential customers catch is they have an API monitor set up, but it's sort of just, it's looking at the API and it's saying, does it respond and is there a status 200? And that's all it's doing. And that sort of seems like really basic and there's probably a lot of people in this that are watching this that say they would never do that, but it is prevalent throughout every large enterprise we deal with today. And so what we mean by that is the difference between uptime and functional uptime is quite literally like an API is almost like a book and you should be analyzing every object, the entire structure, every, every bit of data associated, like even something like the price range should be from $1 to $3 or the size of shoes is different than the size object for pants, for example, like that level of detail is what you should be looking for, not just in a functional test, but in a monitor as well. So like we like to, we like to analogize it this way. Like just imagine you're a parent and you have a, and you have, you're worried about your child's education. So you want to like measure their progress. And so that's really the difference between are you measuring their progress by their attendance or from the grades they get on their standardized tests. So that's sort of like how we like to analogize it. Your monitor should be more than an attendance. It, sh it should be standardized testing of those APIs. And so foundationally, what really causes, like what the real result of this are, are two things. It's uncaught downtime and security breaches. The uncaught downtime part is one of the most expensive because the problem is you're not catching that it's down. So everything seems fine. So like, you know, we, we spoke about one of my previous employers. We had monitoring set up for the API and all it was doing was actually looking in the logs and seeing if their largest API consumer had made an API call in the last 10 minutes. That's what they viewed as monitoring. Like, did they make a call? Yes or no, they did. All right, so the API must be fine. That's what led to the creation of API Fortress when we started realizing like that's not enough. And so the other part of it that's interesting, and you know, everyone uses the word security to, to scare people into making these quick decisions, but I like to sort of ground security a little bit more. So, you know, Akamai said 83% of all web traffic in 2018 was API traffic. So that means like there's a lot of data going over APIs. But the thing that's really interesting, and you'll see what Gartner says there, it's 95% of these vulnerabilities are the customer's fault. So what that means is people love talking about hackers and all that stuff, but it's actually just screw ups, human error, functional errors that lead to most of these major breaches we're seeing today. And if, you know, you know, I won't go into too much detail here, but if you go to our blog, we actually have posts about three different breaches that happened and all three were functional problems or they were just like a poor, a poor setup. So like Twitter had an API that would, if you gave it a phone number, it would tell you which account is associated with it but there was no rate limiting. And so like, uh, so countries with bad actors were doing that to connect like a phone number with a person's profile and sort of stripping that privacy from them. India had a similar issue where they actually had an a API that shouldn't have been public that was, and they, they didn't throttle it. So people were able to just guess random, like it's not a social security number, but something similar, just guess at random, constantly guessing them until they get one, they get a bunch of private information. And the United States Postal Service was simply just, they allowed you to do a search by a wild card, which then returned the results for everyone. A lot of those things can be tested properly if you do proper monitoring and testing. Like rate limiting is just a load test. Make sure you can't hit it too much. The United States Postal Service, like you should be testing how a search function returns if you send it weird characters or characters that are are possible, but shouldn't be such as like a wild card. That should just be part of a functional test. And so the real issue foundationally, like when, when we sort of look into this stuff, we'd like to take a step back and start understand like, well, how is this happening? Why is this happening? And it sort of comes down to, to this. And again, you know, this is our opinion, but it's our opinion based on speaking with, we've spoken now to hundreds of customers and we have hundreds of customers. Like it's, this comes up often and there's a shift happening, but the problem is like who owns API uptime? So every company has their own title for the team that would own uptime, but 
fundamentally, it's usually a monitoring team. And if you look at like the major monitors available today, you know, these are some of the more popular ones, but there's plenty of other ones. So when you, you look at those and what you notice is that like, those are just, those are APMs. Those are just monitors that are adding some API functionality as of late. But foundationally speaking, that's not what they were built for. So what they're doing is they're going sort of from the top down, trying to get down to API testing, as opposed to like, you know, what we are and what other functional platforms such as us are, which is bottom up, like actually create a proper test and then just run it constantly as a monitor. So to be more specific about the issues with these platforms, uh, I'll sort of just sort of dive into where they come up short, uh, specific to API monitoring. One is they only do synthetic testing. And so like if you do a search for some of them, you look up API and they are very specific in using the word synthetic because that's sort of code word for like, it's, it's, it's slight, it's basic. It's, it's not overly functionally detailed. Like you can't do like, you can't like reproduce a consumer flow, for example. And so that's one of those keywords that you start seeing these platforms are coming out. Well, we now do API testing. We just added a synthetic API monitor. That's sort of a red flag, but just by the fact that they're using the word synthetic. And so that's something to just keep an eye out on. The other one is API privacy. So as we were saying before, like APIs are a direct connection to a lot of sensitive information. And so using a third party cloud to monitor the API means the API is public or you whitelisted IPs, which can be potential like security issues. Like we always suggest with those very sensitive APIs that you should be monitoring them internally using something on premises and behind the firewall. It, those APIs shouldn't be exposed to other people. And that's an issue with a lot of these monitoring platforms. Then uh, the other big one is just the fact that people are using a very different set of tests to monitor as they're using for everything else. So as you deploy APIs, you may have a CICD process in place and you may have automated testing. Well, those automated tests are true functional tests. But then when you start going into the monitoring section, it's a different team using a different platform. And so they're building these new tests from scratch. So what's happening is, and it's just the reality of the situation is, what they're building are very basic tests. These are not often testing professionals. And so there's just not much that can be done with it. Like they do the bare minimum. Um, the next one is the intelligence of the test. So just in general, like the, the tests themselves aren't as detailed as they should be. So as I was saying, like reproducing a consumer flow, like uh, the, the search, add to cart, checkout, all of that should be reproduced on, on that level. It should be the same amount of effort you put into it as you would a functional test. So um, just in a nutshell, like just to sort of, you know, this is all theoretical and stuff. So I like to ground it a bit. So. Let me just give you an example of a couple of our customers where when they brought us in, something changed. So we had a customer that was a book publisher. So with books, uh, they have a whole collection of books that they print out. So they have an ISBN. That's what it's called. It's like a product ID, the ISBNs. Well, they had already done some monitoring, but it was thin synthetic monitoring, and they had like a 99.9% .9 uptime. So what they did when they onboarded with us was they wanted to get they wanted to make sure that their partner APIs were extra strong. So they really wanted to validate that it was a third party, it was validated by third parties. So quite literally what we did with the platform and helped them to do is they had one endpoint that gave you a list of all the active products that were for sale, all the ISBNs. Then they had another, another endpoint that allowed you to dive into each of those products individually. So what we did is we connected them. Like the very first test would run through it would give you a list of all active ISBNs. And then in that same test, it would then pick 500 of them randomly. It would pick 500 of those randomly and go into them in detail. And so what happened when they actually did that is they started getting a bunch of 404s. There's a bunch to the story and I think it's on one of our blog posts, but what fun fundamentally was happening was they were using an API manager, which was caching their ISBN, like their product listing endpoint, it was caching it. And so for until that cache refreshed, because whenever they did database update every like week or so, they would have outdated an endpoint with cat that was cached that was outdated for hours. But you're not able to catch that if you're just testing the endpoint that lists the ISBNs, because of course, like those are all the ones available. And then if you just test the endpoint that gives you product details on its own, 
you probably are using like a small series of test data. And that small series of test data will always have like 10 of them that are valid and all 10 work, so it's fine. You really need to randomize and do truly data-driven testing. But doing that as a monitor is a significant change because the minute you're doing it against production environments, that's when you're really seeing like the difference because production data is not the same as your staging environments with their testing data. So that's like a big differentiator. Uh, the next one is, uh, I'll go through it quickly, but really what happened on the next one is uh, there's this company that allows you to upload a product to sell it. Think of something along the lines of like an eBay. So there's different teams that are involved in the product. There's the API product team that define like uh, when you upload a product, category should be required. And then they had the customer upload team, which is really just a website team. All they were interested in is creating a website that allowed you to upload in your product to be sold and it injected itself into the database. And then the homepage navigation team knew what the API product team wanted to do. And so they were, what they were doing is they were saying like, all right, so the product team said the categories required. Homepage navigation team was aware the categories required. But the customer upload team, the team that made the web page where you upload a product, they didn't know it was required. And this is simply just siloing of a large company. Like this isn't some big dramatic thing. It's, it's just a silo. And so what happened was people were building their product, uploading it. But then when you went to like men's scarves, the product wasn't there. And it was simply just because category, which should have been required, was missing. This, these are the sorts of things you catch with like a detailed API test. Because again, what we're seeing here isn't necessarily a failure of the API. And that's something I'm just sort of trying to reinforce here. An API test catches a lot of stuff besides an API, including like the caching issue we were just talking about. So just sort of like to, to sort of summarize like what we're talking about. What we're saying is that there's a difference between uptime and functional uptime. And functional uptime is foundationally much more important, especially when it comes to the APIs, which are the backbone of your actual systems. So like what we're suggesting is not crazy. Like we're saying you already have end-to-end -end tests when you're making these APIs. You already have like load testing capabilities. You're doing functional testing. Running all of those on a schedule to us is functional uptime monitoring. Like everyone has like a, a has a, has a CI CD process in place and has all of these automated test suites. Not everyone, but a lot of people. If you have a test suite that validates the functionality of an API before it's delivered, you should be leveraging that as your monitor as well. That's the point we're trying to, we're trying to make. These existing monitoring tools that are backing into API monitoring aren't the right choice. You should be using the foundational functional testing of your API functional tests, end-to-end -end tests, and integration tests, use those as your monitors. And there's, you know, there's a lot of platforms available today that can do that. You know, we're just one. So it's like, this is being agnostic. There's a lot of open source software as well you can use for the exact same thing. It's creating your automated testing suite, but running it on a schedule against various environments, including production. So again, just sort of in a nutshell, your functional tests and your end-to-end -end tests running on a schedule. That's as basic as, as, as I can make it. Like there's a lot of nuance and details to it, but, but foundationally, like that's the point we're trying to make. Like, make. like I, we deal every day with QA experts, people that quite literally, all they do is create great functional tests. Those are the people that should be in charge of validating that an API is up and running properly. Using their expertise to create these tests in the platform that works best for them or in the open source suite that works best for them or the language that works best for them. Using their expertise to create these monitors and then running them on a schedule is the best way to do your API monitoring today. And it really doesn't matter like what sort of platform you prefer or what you already have in-house for monitoring. It's not about what you're using for monitoring. It's about what you're using for functional testing and running that as a monitor. So. Again, the final piece of like uh, the, the whole story here is you probably already have some functional tests. M monitoring, like proper monitoring means functional testing on a schedule to, in our opinion, that's like the best way to do it. And there's a big difference between uptime and functional uptime. So foundationally, like what we're saying is use your automated testing suite as your API monitor. Like that's why we call ourselves the API Fortress and API testing and monitoring suite because both are in one. You create the test for one purpose, run as part of a CI pipeline, but then you schedule it within our platform to run automatically every, every five minutes or so. So it's, it's a fairly like straightforward thing. And the difference 
for us is just if you're not monitoring and catching functional issues, if it's just the API is down, it's down. The functional issues are actually the more nuanced and expensive ones that end up leading to like your customers being unhappy, you're burning money because you don't even know there's an issue. And just as important, and it goes back to sort of the first thing I said is the security issues. Like these functional tasks can help you minimize the human error that leads to 95% of these, these hacks and these vulnerabilities, which are not hacks, these are just human error that goes wrong. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, that's what I wanted to share, but uh, hopefully it made sense. Uh, we're also, we're gonna have this presentation put together for you guys to, uh, for you guys to share it with anyone that was watching as well. So I'll give yeah, it back. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Sure. Um, and for anyone who is attending Austin, I think you'll be giving an expanded version of this talk at that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's something yeah. We've, we've been evolving since the beginning of the year. It's sort of a new initiative because of the common out, how common this problem has been for us. Yeah. So now right. it's like a big, a big driver for, for what we're talking about with customers. Awesome. Um, I'm going to give you a very foundational question, and then I want to address some of the Q&A stuff here. Um, what is the difference between API monitoring and API testing? Uh, I mean, to me, like we're trying to remove the difference. What we're saying is monitoring is that test on a schedule against various environments, including production. Like that's how we're trying to redefine it. Like you right. already have API tests, use them as a monitor. Right. Yeah, and you talked a lot about those those other kind of platforms and how we need to redefine how it's being uh, put together. Yeah, um, I mean, people are acting like they're two different things, but it's not. Your yeah. functional test run on a schedule. That's a monitor. Like your load tests, like you can run a functional test as a load test. You run that test a thousand times, and that's a functional load test. It's the same thing with that. It's just also applying to monitoring, and all of those things can run on a schedule against all these different environments. Like the last... Uh, you know, recently we've had a few different customers where it's like one major parent company has purchased various smaller companies and they're setting up like API Fortress at all of these to unify the actual like, are these APIs working properly? Because this company might affect this company because they're all putting all the systems together these days in their sort of like complicated like ecosystem of APIs. Yeah, uh, maybe you can talk more to that. One of the questions was how are multiple environments being handled? Yeah, so um, uh, one of the important things when you set up a test is to variableize the actual domain. So it's, if it's an active test where the very first step is like it's a get and makes the call, variableize it so you can replace like domain, for example, to run against different domains. That's mm -hmm. one of the keys when you're setting up these tests. Make sure they're reusable against, against all sorts of different environments. So like you want to make sure you, when you create these tests, you're using professionals and they know exactly how to suite or the, how to you know, code it properly and it's it's reusable without being too weak because you don't want false positives, but you yeah. also don't want it just to pass anything. I think you were telling me you have a, like a lot of different deployment options too, right? Another question oh, yeah. I was asking like, how do you deploy API Fortress monitors? Yeah, well, it's actually, it's, it's interesting. Because the problem is like when you're dealing with large organizations, it doesn't matter how secure you are. Like, Ultimately, API Fortress and a lot of these platforms are cloud platforms, but the difference between it is your cloud versus their cloud. So we do, right. like, we have two offerings. We have multiple. It's like SaaS or it's a hybrid in between or it's, we call it on-premises, but that's just like, that's legitimately a legacy, a legacy phrasing because it's not on-premises. It's in their AWS as opposed to our AWS or that's their good. Google yeah. Cloud as opposed to ours. Like, we give you a container and you deploy it in whatever environment you want. So it, it can go into any sort of deployment method that works for your security team because that's one of the major problems we see. Like making private APIs publicly accessible might make monitoring easier, but it is a danger. Right. There could be some security issues there. There always are. Yeah. <laughs> the problem too is a lot of these security issues aren't caught for months. The, right. the, the Twitter one, they reported about it in February but it actually happened in October and they caught it in December. So like bad actor, bad countries with bad actors were just going after and hammering that API, connecting people's like social identities with their actual phone numbers, which sort of strips the privacy away. Because a lot of people, you know, the Kevin Durant of the world, they have the, they have the egg, they have the fake profile. Like they don't want to connect it with like their professional, right. their professional lives. And sometimes it's, 
I mean, that's the danger of social media in general and why I try to stay away, but that's, that's dangerous stuff like that. And that's just an API that shouldn't have been live and didn't have enough rate limiting. I think a Marriott experienced a similar issue. Uh, vulnerability it was just there for around two years or so before anyone found it. Uh, yeah, hopefully with some better testing capabilities, API owners can avoid that kind of, uh, yeah, vulnerability. Um, one last question for you before we hand the torch. Sure. Dimitri is asking, how often should we run reproduction tests on average? We suggest every five minutes. And uh, there's actually an interesting item here where people talk about, well, won't that just affect our systems negatively so the analytics will be off? We think every five minutes is enough and 20 calls, you know, every five minutes is what, 20 calls per hour. That's if we mostly deal with large organizations, 20 hits over the course of an hour will not fundamentally change like their massive, their analytics. They will not skyrocket their AWS bills. Like it's, we're not, we don't suggest every minute because that just, it's, you don't get any super useful information off of that. Like we think five minutes is good, two and a half if you have to, uh, but that's really sort of the, the crux of what we, what we suggest over here. But everyone has their own opinions, but we're talking about running through like search add to cart checkout. That would be one monitor in one suite. You run that whole thing every five minutes and you're in a pretty good place of understanding if there's an issue or not. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, real quick. Ahmed is wondering, do you have a recommendation for the API functional test coverage? What do you mean? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Um, here, I'll, I'll chat with him and we'll get back. Sure. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go on to Derek now. So Derek, whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to start sharing your screen. Thanks for your time, Patrick. Um, really appreciate having you on the call. And yeah, we'll see you in person soon. So going over to Derek here on what does API monitoring mean for product managers? Kind of a different take on things, looking into perhaps analytics that affect the business side of things. So yeah, take it away. Cool. Well, no, I really appreciate this, Bill. And uh, you know, as he was mentioning, a big thing for us is how do we align the, the, the metrics that you want to track to the business goals and product goals compared to what might be uh, uh, you're tracking today. I mean, there's a lot of in infrastructure and engineering metrics, uptime in SOA to average latency, errors per minute, and so on. But a lot of times that can be lacking in figuring out what is the right product strategy for your API. I like to personally uh, align my different metrics that I'm tracking to one of three different areas. Uh, and, and for any product, usually adoption, engagement, and retention are the primary goals that a product org is focusing on along with maybe other stakeholders like growth and, and, and business teams. And I'll speak a little bit more on what these actually mean, but where does a disconnect come from when you're trying to leverage infrastructure metrics to track against these business goals. Well, here's a, a few different examples, right? On the marketing side, you have page views and signups. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're engaged with your API. Are they actually getting any value by integrating your APIs? And on the flip side, stuff like request per minute or average latency, you know, those values can be uh, artificially high just because you have a customer that is probing your API over and over just to do a health check, right? But does that actually mean they're engaged with the API or does that just mean they're, they're setting up some tests? Similarly with uh, average latency, you know, at a high level, this can show you, do you have a spike in latency and that type of stuff. But you know, for, for most APIs, if it's consistently high latency, your users, your consumers of the API can deal with it. One of the biggest problems with the APIs is that there's variance in that, right? How, how do uh, you measure that variance and how do you ensure that you can actually uh, mitigate that for further uh, consumers? And I'll just walk through each of these three different areas, starting off with adoption. Uh, in this case, uh, the best way to do this is map out your funnel, right? And, and this might vary a little bit depending on uh, this is a public API versus an internal API, but there's three fundamental stages 
that someone takes as they adopt your API for another team or as another third party developer. And that's a pre-integration stage, the test slash sandbox stage, and finally production. And there's really two pieces to track within this funnel, the conversion rate for each step, but also more importantly, the time to reach that next step, right? And, and funnels in general have been used, you know, across marketing and sales and other areas. But a lot of times those steps might be very quick. You click on a Facebook ad, sign up for a service and suddenly you're buying a pair of shoes. But for an API, it may take days or weeks or even months to get to that fine, uh, next step there. So what do these uh, three different steps mean? Pre-integration, that can just get them to sign up. If it's an internal API, that might be evangelizing with different teams who have a different use case to leverage your API. If this is a public API, API which is becoming more and more prevalent within the API space, it might be a, a combination of content, speaking at conferences, to running paid, paid ads on different uh, developer-focused networks. However, when we get to the sandbox stage, this is where stuff gets really important and interesting. There's a metric that uh, uh, is becoming more and more prevalent across API first companies, which is time to first hello world. There are a couple other ways to, to position this time to first API um, call, uh, uh, time to uh, first value. And that's really the process of signing up, making a simple test app, which could be through done like a, a Postman or other tool, making that very first API transaction. Okay, at least they validated and, and put into the uh, effort to test your API beyond just a simple Facebook uh, uh, sign up. And the next stage, the, the, the production stage I was referring to earlier, is time to first working app. Sometimes this can be called the time to first paid app. And this is when a developer was able to actually build a full solution or full app around your API and deploy it uh, uh, so that there's value created for their users, their customers, partners, who, or whoever they see as, as an end user of that solution they're building. So let's just walk through an example for Argolia, uh, one of my personal favorite companies. Yeah, if we're looking at the uh, pre-integration stage, you're really just tracking the developers are signing up, maybe they generated an API key or somehow had some intent of looking into your API. Then when you move into the sandbox stage, these are folks who maybe made a, a single API call against, you know, uh, indexing a, 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 a entity or, or maybe grabbing something through the API. So they don't really have uh, something fully of value that they can demonstrate to their customers, to their users, and that's where the production states comes in, right? These are developers who completed at least a thousand uh, uh, index operations, plus they queried some data and, and there was actually real data in, in those queries. It wasn't just a, a empty array or an empty list. Once these different stages are mapped out, then you can understand where, where stuff is lacking. So for example, at the pre-integration stage, it might be just about awareness, right? How do you get uh, more folks know about your API and the functionality that it provides to that team or organization. Uh, once you get to the sandbox stage, a lot of times uh, this is a, a little bit lower number than expected because of uh, issues around onboarding. You know, you don't have the right SDK do uh, framework designed uh, for their specific use case. So it takes them a lot longer to implement your API. But then finally, when you get into stuff like production stage, uh, those issues are usually very different because now you're talking about different stakeholders that are not just the individual developer that could be uh, a blockers on deploying that API to production. For example, compliance risk, it could be something just, you know, checkbox items like performance or uh, uh, a functional testing that is required even by like a, a product like API Fortress to make sure the API is doing what it uh, says it's going to do and no data integrity issues. The second area that I like to look at is API engagement, right? And, and as mentioned, there's a lot of false metrics around requests per minute because those can be inflated by health probes and, and tests that are not true engagement from your API consumers. Uh, one of the biggest North Star metrics we can look at 
is weekly active API tokens. Um, a better way to reorganize this is if you can do API, uh, uh, unique API users, just because sometimes you'll have developers that might be creating tokens for a test environment, a sandbox environment, and so on, which, which doesn't give you the full accurate picture. Once you're able to plot a North Star metric like this, they can really dig down into what is driving this metric and, and where does it uh, shortfall. For example, which marketing uh, channels are actually driving the most integrations with your API? Are there particular SDKs that have a higher or lower conversion or integration rate? And just moving on to the next screen here, this is taking that same concept of weekly active API tokens, but now breaking it down by acquisition channel. Now granted, depending on the consumers of this API, uh, you might want to track this in different ways. So for a public API, that's a little bit more self-service. Uh, you know, you're tracking AdWords and LinkedIn and other uh, uh, paid or, or, or free uh, channels out there. Uh, but for an internal API, you know, where did they get started from? You know, how did they discover you? Was it from a, a lunch and learn? Was it from uh, exposure to a different group or different organization? And it's tracking those trends over time. Similarly, just tracking stuff like uh, which customers or which partners are, are the highest users of your APIs, looking at how they use your APIs differently from the, the long tail customers, right? And the reason why I want to understand this is that way you can drill into which endpoints are being the most popular by your top customers. Is there something that did not provide the aha moment for the ones who don't really have a growth in API traffic, right? And, and this requires adding additional instrumentation around segmenting by SDK versus uh, endpoint that's being called to, to even like geo-like information. The next thing I was uh, speaking to earlier was around latency. Uh, average latency is a great uh, um, first level metric you can look at to understand, hey, is, is, is this a, a, a latency within the bounds for, for SOA requirements? However, it hides a lot of variance that your customers might be unhappy with when it comes to uh, API experience. Uh, what I mean by that is an API that has a consistently high latency, say 200 milliseconds, that could be perfectly fine because your API consumers are already able to handle that. They understand the performance of calling this API. But if you have an API, uh, a couple of particular endpoints where normally it's around 10 milliseconds, but you know, every now and then it, it jumps up to two seconds, five seconds or something, right? It's much harder for your API consumers to even account for this. It can lead to race conditions. It can lead, uh, lead for them to uh, not handle caching in the right way and so on. And then breaking this down by different endpoints versus customers and so on allows you to really find those hotspots and optimize for you know, your P90th uh, uh, latency or P99th or, or whatever it is that you want to track on that side. The last thing I want to speak to, which is I believe is the most important is API retention. The reason why re API retention is important is because a lot of times you might start focusing on adoption uh, initially, just because, I mean, you can't really track engagement or retention without any users in the first place, but eventually, you're gonna see if people are actually extracting long-term value from your API. In terms of retention, and, and, and this is actually borrowed from stuff like mobile analytics, where they're tracking at the retention curve flattens out or does it go down to zero? We, we had a customer of ours where, you know, they, they integrated and started to track their uh, API retention. They noticed that after about three days, it literally went straight down to zero, which means they have a leaky boat. You know, they're acquiring users, they're acquiring folks who use their API, but then it stops, right? That they, for whatever reason, had struggled with a particular integration or they just weren't able to meet their business needs. A good retention curve usually levels out at some floor. So you can see here, you know, day two, day three, day four, and so on, it levels out at this point. Well, the really the important thing of why you want to track API retention is because now dig into and group by different things like SDK being used, the version of the API that might be used, 
to even the features and, and other things. So moving on to the next screen here, we're now breaking down API retention by the different SDK being used as they access the API. And we can see at day one, you know, Node.js and Python, you know, 53 and 32% of our user base is still accessing and being engaged with this API. But if we drill down to PHP, we can see that by day two, we have 0% of our user base still returning and engaging with its API. To me, that tells me that there's something wrong with my PHP SDK. It could be buggy, it could be uh, uh, just not having the right features already uh, implemented in the SDK, and this allows you to prioritize your product roadmap to look at PHP or maybe deprecate it if, if it's just something that is not uh, a viable option going uh, in the future. That's all I have in terms of product metrics. Just as a, as a uh, wrap up, the biggest thing is thinking about what your product goals are, whether it's around adoption, which might be the first goal uh, when it comes to launching a new API, but over time, you're gonna start looking at stuff like engagement and retention to understand, should you keep investing in adoption or are there other things that you can make and change in the product for this to really uh, create something of value for your uh, consumers and customers. Any questions so far? Um, yeah, awesome. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, I think, let's see, we haven't had any Q&A questions yet, um, but I have some questions for you. Sure. Yeah. Um, here, let me just put it over to my screen here. Um, I was thinking, so once API owners have all these metrics, which are seem very helpful, I'm just wondering like how you take those and directly translate that into improving developer experience. Like, uh, do you see your customers uh, changing the way their developer portals are set up or like literally changing the onboarding experience with different sandboxes or testing environments? Like, how are people using the knowledge of uh, low retention rates? Yeah, so uh, when it comes to like improving the developer experience and pinpointing where is that falling off, um, that's usually where I start with the funnel, the, the three stages I was mentioning earlier, which is the sign up, the sandbox stage, and the production stage. Uh, at the sign up stage, usually it's just about awareness. If you don't have enough people even signing up for the API, that means, you know, if this is an internal API, having more lunch and learns, understanding, you know, other business requirements across different teams and projects. Whereas once you get into these later stages, so that's that, um, that, that first API call, you know, one way is to improve that is through better documentation, making it easier to even integrate this API, which can be done with a lot of the new, you know, deploy to Heroku, deploy to Azure buttons that can be embedded within your documentation or your GitHub readme's. Um, but then once you get to the, that last stage, which can be the hardest stage, the time to first working out, a lot of times that is out of the control of the initial developer that you're working with to deploy uh, uh, your API solution. What I mean by that is there's security compliance review. Uh, there is stuff like uh, functional testing requirements, performance testing requirements. Uh, it could be just a matter of they didn't fully understand the value or, or, or they didn't have enough users during like a pay, beta launch of this API. Right. And, and once you do recognize those drop off rates or how long does it take, can you do something with your developer experience, whether it's adding more documentation to explain and, and get on board as quick as possible, or does it mean you need to uh, focus more into tools and, and sales enablement material Sounds cliche, I know we're, we're really uh, more on the developer platform side, mm -hmm. but you know, speaking to your uh, security compliance, you know, having those uh, policies in place and allowing your champion or your person that you're working with to, to share that material with whoever their managers are, or whoever is a final sponsor for this project. Because mm -hmm. after all, people don't integrate APIs just for the sake of it. They're integrating an API to solve some problem that they have, right? whether that's you know, for their customers or whether that's an internal need for their team. Right. Bye. 
I mean, yeah, I think this is a very mature look, way to look at API as a product. That's been the, the trend lately, right? Um, especially with these public services, people are viewing them as products now. And once you start to do that, you kind of have to have more empathy for the user and, and more developer empathy if we're targeting developers. So thinking about um, time to first paid app, I think that's critical. I mean, there's really two revenue models here and you have to wait for that, that third party developer to be able to have a fully fledged service with some sort of uh, revenue generating activity to then uh, you know, graduate to the next tier if you're leaving a freemium tier, et cetera. So I'm wondering, like, do you feel this can actually help inform monetization around an API? Like for the owners that are trying to construct a nice program that makes sense and helps onboard developers with a premium platform and then using these metrics, can they help, can that help guide, you know, the creation of these very, specific upgrade platforms and different levels. Yeah, definitely. And, and one thing that I didn't really touch on during this presentation is adding other business uh, uh, metrics or business value that you have already, yeah. such as a size of company to, uh, are, are they on a free plan versus maybe on, on a, a, a low tier plan versus you know enterprise level agreement. Um, and then looking at how they're using your API differently, the, the, the enterprise customers versus someone that is just getting going with their API. And once you do understand that, you can then onboard your, or, or set up your onboarding to focus on that first API call that really demonstrates the value of your API platform or program, right? Mm -hmm. There's no reason to have, you know, onboarding flow that has 20 different steps you have to do this and then do this configuration. Just have a, a very simple, you know, uh, batteries included, but optional. I, I, I firmly believe in that where, you know, focus on the very first thing that you see the most people getting to the next step, getting to that time to first working app because they were able to test your API with, with a Postman or, or other tool out there uh, and see, hey, okay, th this is something of value, right? Um, in your blog post, you also touched on something else, and I'm going to lob this to you. Um, you mentioned that there are some metrics that should not be considered North Star metrics. So what are those that you see people following too much and putting too much investment in? Sure. And th this is usually just because of uh, the way that analytics is done today in, in most organizations. You have your infrastructure level metrics that is really aligned to engineering goals. And then you have the, the marketing metrics, which are aligned to top of funnel goals, you know, for the marketing, lead gen activities, that type of stuff. And when it comes to, you know, lead gen and marketing activities, you know, there's page views, there's signups, but in all honesty, like anyone can generate a bunch of signups by, you know, accelerating their Facebook ad spend or um, just getting the wrong people through the door. Maybe they're not a developer, or maybe they didn't really have, uh, they didn't really align with the, the true uh, use case that you're solving, right? And, and that's why looking a little deeper after a sign up, what did they actually do? Did they uh, integrate your API token? Did they actually make an API call from Postman? Did they create an entire working app that, um, you know, is, is using five different areas of your API, five different endpoints on average? Those type of things where you're looking at the engagement level stuff. Um, the second piece is uh, when it comes to infrastructure level metrics, you have stuff like, you know, requests per minute, errors per minute. Those are great metrics for the engineering team because they're trying to understand, you know, how's my infrastructure doing? Do I need to deploy some more servers? Do I need to optimize this area of my API? But from a product standpoint, you know, you should treat infrastructure as a black box, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter if you have three servers or a hundred servers and you know, at the request per minute is, you know, X or Y because you're going to have an API and you can have your users that is to keep probing your API over and over and over again, just as a test probe. And, and that should be a good practice by anyone consuming someone else's API. But does that really tell you that they're engaged with the API or does that just mean they set up a test that keeps pinging it? Yep. And that's where we're coming back to the, you know, weekly active tokens 
or, or how many different endpoints on average each customer account is accessing? Is it five? Is it 10? Is it only one? Uh, to just understand uh, uh, how much of the service area they're, uh, they're able to attack. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Having a more granular metric to look at that is actually reflecting real usage. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. Uh, let's open the floor maybe to Patrick as well um, on this next question. So Dimitri is asking, our team is currently developing a new developer portal. We have a few APIs and Swagger SDKs for Android and iOS, as well as guides and tutorials. The question is, should we put all APIs in one website or should we leave it uh, in separate locations? What are the best practices or general suggestions? The main goal is to be able to track retention. Um, I mean, personally, from my research, I would say it kind of depends on how related the APIs are and what the business goals are for segmenting these sort of microservices. Could make sense to unite them into one developer portal. Uh, but if we're thinking about analytics and monitoring and testing, uh, do you guys have any specific uh, goals? Maybe to Patrick first. Yeah, I mean, in general, what I find interesting is that everyone dreams of Swagger, like complete spec file coverage, but it's all theoretical. Like mm -hmm. our platform can actually generate a test from a spec file, but still like the most commonly used feature is generate a test from a payload because they know how to make the API call and it may not necessarily be properly like spec'd out. And so the part that's just interesting to me about this question is like that a lot of people have a lot of APIs that are internal only. So what he seems to be talking about is like the external developer, yeah. uh, developer centric APIs. These are third party APIs. So th those definitely should all be in the same place, but putting the internal ones out there is, is not, I, I don't know if that's what he was suggesting, but that's definitely not a, practice I would suggest what's interesting is there are platforms out there that are like uh, what's the name of it? rapid API they actually have a they help you create an internal marketplace of APIs so that's actually very specifically used for companies that have a bunch of internal APIs so you can choose these are internal and it's internal internally documented but then if you want to expose some of them they would expose just the documents and just the endpoints as well so there are platforms out there today that can help you with these these sorts of items where everything is in one place, but it's only, but only some things are publicized. But again, that's, you know, that, that costs money to incorporate that, but those sorts yeah. of platforms that have been really interesting because one of the things we deal with every day is our customers bought, acquired other companies and now they have a bunch of APIs, they don't know what they do. So they do sort of need like an internal portal to track these APIs internally, because you may have, you may find yourself rebuilding endpoints that already exist because you didn't know they existed. You're new at the company or they just recently acquired another company that has a whole litany of APIs you don't understand either. Mm -hmm. it's, a lot of these headaches we deal with are specific to, like, to, to large enterprises. Yeah. So the more APIs you have, the more you need some sort of unified developer portal and discovery mechanism. Yeah, it's internal versus external, sure. Yeah. But I do think there should be an internal portal as well. Gotcha. Um, yeah, let's, uh, Derek, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, I'm just going to echo, you know, the same thing. Uh, in some ways, you know, our flow is we have a lot of different, you know, internal services. Each one of those will generate a Docker spec, but then that's consumed and aggregated into one single area kind of like a rapid API. Uh, and, and in this case, we actually use uh, a Jekyll and middlemen and a few other static generators to just pretty it up a little bit more because some of these APIs are externally visible. Some of these are not, and we don't want you know, everyone to see the, you know, the intricacies of, of this API that probably doesn't have a real uh, use case externally for our customers. Uh, but just leveraging uh, uh, Swagger as much as possible but going beyond just what Swagger does by itself, because otherwise it can be a little bit too confusing. You're not really able to create the right um, ways to onboard and get started with the API. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, leveraging you know static documentation is, is a great way to do this. Um, the only thing that I, I have seen over and over when it comes to documentation, it's super, super hard to keep up to date, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fields get excluded, even with stuff like Swagger, you might have another area that is not using a Swagger spec. 
So try and you know, have a central source of truth as much as possible. For us, that means uh, you know, we have the Swagger spec, uh, but we also have other developer documentation that's not specifically around API reference. And that is actually pulled from each respective project's GitHub readme. And then we can consolidate that to together into one uh, um, static site. But the same uh, same content, both in the README of the GitHub repo, along with the, the our you know most of the comp slash docs uh, uh, portal. Yeah. One thing one thing I can say is the there's uh, there's platforms on the internet that allow you to validate your Swagger spec is actually properly formatted. I'd mm -hmm. suggest using that because often people try to generate a test off of a Swagger spec and they come to us saying like your generator doesn't work. It's actually the swag Swagger spec itself has a foundational issue in it. Cause there's a lot of different ways you can write those things, but you should really be making sure you're writing it properly. Cause the whole goal is so that it can be, I mean, there's platforms like readme.io that allow you to generate documentation off a of swagger spec. You just share your swagger and the platform automatically generates a whole documentation suite for you automatically. But the doc, but the swagger has to actually be properly formatted or the open API spec has to be properly formatted, formatted. And there's a lot of platforms that can check that for you. Yeah, we have, we have some blog posts on different um, documentation generation solutions based on open API spec, as well as some different linting solutions to validate um, those specifications as well. So do you think that having some sort of automated spec driven testing is possible, Patrick, within this like CI CD pipeline you're discussing earlier? Not 100%, no, because by definition, those spec files are not intelligent enough. They don't give you enough information. So they're a good jumping off point. So mm -hmm. it'll get you 80% of the way there, but then you should have an actual testing expert adding domain knowledge and creating these proper variations. Because as I was saying, something such as, you know, pants, the size range for pants is different than the size range for shoes. So one retailer might have those two different products, but they both have a size object. You can add that sort of nuanced intelligence to a test that makes that tests to make sure that it's, if it's a pair of pants, this is the range for size. If not, that's an issue. So you use the test generation as a kicking off point, but then you're always adding knowledge based on what you're learning about the API program and its business goals initially. But there is no spec file format that's perfectly formulated for test generation that's anything more than like a good foundation none of them are comprehensive enough well we'll be following the community and see if uh, the tooling area evolves so yeah thank you to both of you i think our time is nearly up um any final thoughts on best practices for api monitoring to leave people with here Maybe Derek. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, it's just, again, use your functional tests as a monitor and use it against all your environments that are important to you. So you can actually see the improvement as it goes through or, the, or, or, or if it's getting worse, but you see as it's going through from the staging to gold staging to pre-prod and production, monitor all of those environments constantly. Because don't forget, there's other teams that are requiring the use of those environments themselves do their own work. And so it's, it's once you create a smart test and you could change the domain to be whatever you want, use it against the various environments, not just production and not just staging. And Derek, what, what would be your nutshell here? The biggest thing I've seen, and this comes from, you know, any metrics or analytics system that you're looking at, you know, make sure you focus on, you know, a couple key North Star metrics, because it's, it's so easy to, you know, drill into dashboard after dashboard, chart after chart, you know, and, and that's great for, you know, root causing something. You want to have all the data accessible, but, you know, having just a couple of metrics they can track week over week, month over month, something they can report on to even your executive or, or your leadership team is really important to track, you know, where do you want to invest more into this project or that project? Um, the last thing is for larger organizations, that had many, many product teams, it definitely helps to standardize what those metrics are. You know, if you have one product team tracking one thing, but another product team tracking something completely different, uh, it, it's just hard to, you know, manage resources. And, and you know, right. one reason why people like to look at these metrics is to you know, move the product roadmap better, 
uh, but also to, you know, get more investment, right? Whether that's, you know, getting budget approval from, you know, your leadership team at the organization. And, and that requires showing why this product is, is taking off, why this product makes sense. Awesome. All right. Yeah, uh, just one last item for me is use yeah. your QA teams mm. are valuable resources and people keep trying to automate QA and minimize the budget of QA, but instead of doing that, you can leverage them to help you with your functional uptime monitoring. And this is a role that they are specifically suited for. If you choose the right platform, you set it up correctly. They have domain knowledge. Right. Trying to bring in an automation expert with no domain knowledge isn't that useful. And so it's just, just keep it in mind. You can empower your QA teams to do a lot more than just QA every day. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to have them involved in this. All right. Well, that's been a, another Nordic APIs live cast. Thanks to everyone for watching. Uh, just a couple of sign off notes here. Thank you to our sponsor, Curity. Check out their OAuth server and API secure, security platform. Follow Nordic APIs at Nordic APIs at Twitter right there. And we have a newsletter that goes out every other week on API strategy tips and event information. Like I said earlier, the call for speakers is open for Platform Summit, and we'll keep it open for other events throughout the year and next year. Um, yeah, we'll hope to see all of you at Austin, where you can watch Patrick Poulin, as well as Derek Gilling, kind of give a, a broader spectrum of the talks that they just gave today. So without anything else, yep, yeah, that's it. Thanks, you guys. Thank you much. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Bill and Patrick. Yep. Thank Bye. you. Bye.